Good evening, everyone. Ooh, that's a little loud, isn't it? That's all right. Um, does anybody have any prayer praise report? Okay. Praise the Lord. That has been on our prayer list for quite a while. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Any other praise reports? Trying to fix this so you don't have to fight with it. I'll fight with it instead. There we go. Yes. sure she was. What a blessing. What a blessing. Any other praise reports? I love you. Amen. Amen. Well, let's start our service with a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for all the words that you've given to us through your, your Bible, uh, the ways that you've spoken to us through songs and the way you just whisper to us in your still small voice. We just thank you for your connection to us and we love you with our whole being. Lord, we invite your presence to be with us tonight as we sing and praise and worship you and also learn from the word of God. Just have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand. We've got Michelle again tonight.
of situations in my life where I've wanted to give up. But it's been those darkest moments that I've sensed his presence oh so near. I've grown in my faith. I've helped others grow in their faith. But we often want to push those hard times, those trying times away. Because it hurts. It's uncomfortable. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you let us walk through the trials, that we can see your hand moving, that we can have an opportunity to see you heal, that we can have an opportunity to see you restore our faith and our joy, to turn our mourning into dancing, our sorrow into joy. Think about the times you've cried out. You've cried out in pain. His name. His name is, name is power. It's breath and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So we see. to the King of Kings. You are my everything, so I will adore you. Oh, we adore you, Jesus. Worthy is the the Lamb who was slain. 
just raise our hands and worship him and praise him right now. Thank him for everything he's done for us. Thank you for being our righteousness, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you. We adore you. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. that we enter into his presence when we enter with thanksgiving in our hearts. So we, we've been very thankful tonight for all that he's done for us. So now's a good time for us to share one another's burdens. I know that last week there was quite a long list and I put actually put it all on a board for the prayer meeting on, third, on Saturday night. So we pray for every need again in uh, we're just pleading the blood of Jesus Christ over ones that need healing, ones that need guidance, ones that have uh, a need for peace in their lives. So uh, now is the time to share so that we can bear one another's burdens and lift these needs to the Lord in prayer. Does anyone have a prayer request? Yes, now. injuries are not a good thing. <laughs> Betty.
Diane. Wow, a, a pacemaker? Okay. Yes. Okay, well, let's, let's take these to the Lord in prayer together corporately, okay? Heavenly Father, we just come before you with all of these needs. We know that you've heard each one of them. You know the answer for each one of them. Lord, you know how to heal, how to make whole, how to bring bodies into alignment. Jesus, we want to come to you right now to pray for Terry, who's been oppressed and depressed and that needs deliverance. Lord, we just plead the blood of Jesus Christ. And in the name of Jesus, we rebuke Satan for discouraging her, for oppressing her, and, and making her feel like this down and out. Lord, we pray that you'll just let her see you see the word of God and let that change her life we thank you for that and then Lord we have several that need a healing touch we pray for Nell's daughter-in-law with a head injury we pray for Jennifer's home, homebound front student where she's sick and the whole family needing help and Lord we pray for Betty with this cancer report and even we pray for Jimmy Oglesby with his pacemaker Lord we pray that you will come into each one of their rooms right now and give that healing touch that comes from the great physician Lord we thank you that we can believe and have faith and trust you to heal in the name of Jesus Lord we thank you again that we can come to you and minister to these people as a church body but we also thank you that you minister to them in a individual way and that you minister to them in a special way we thank you for it we thank you for listening to our hearts cry in jesus name amen 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 you may be seated so let's continue with our worship with um, our offering uh, so we have some ushers that work diligently for us. So while they're doing that, let me just kind of remind you of a couple of things. This Saturday is uh, 39ers. We'll be here in the fellowship hall. We're having a story time, if you want to put it that way. If you haven't heard any of um, Robert Jeter's stories from his childhood, you need to come because they're just amazing stories. His, his parents were missionaries in Cuba, uh, in Africa, different places, and they have some just phenomenal miracles that have occurred in their life. And so uh, if, you, if you ever go over to uh, Sagu up in the Full Life Center on the second floor, is the Hugh P. Jeter prayer room and because that's his dad, and they were powerful on the mission field. And so we're going to have some stories. It's, it's just amazing. So hopefully you'll come for that and then on Sunday after church we're going to have a meeting for the greeters we're going to start up the greeting again uh, we do have some more guidelines that we didn't have before because of the COVID um, mess I'm going to call it a mess <laughs> so we're going to talk through that on Sunday so that we, we're prepared and ready to go forth and, and make people feel welcomed so um, Tonight, uh, we have a wonderful man that's going to minister to us, and 
I've always messed up, I think, with his introduction. So I went to Google. <laughs> I Googled his name, and it comes up. And it's a good picture. Whenever I Google mine, mine's a terrible picture. But um, it, it gives his degrees, all of them that he has, a little bit of a biography. Do you want me to read it all? <laughs> I know he, he's not that kind of a guy, but it's, he's, a, he's very impressive. So if, if you get bored during the service, you know, just, you know, just, <laughs> just Google him and, and you can read more about him. But it's my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Clancy Hayes. Let's welcome him. Man, oh man. <laughs> Talk about impressive. <laughs> the fact that he is walking is impressive. Amen. Um, <clears throat> this is echoing a little bit. Is it sounding echoey to you? All right, then I will do this. Can I do that? All right. Uh, greetings. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Um, since uh, the last time I got my two COVID shots and my wife got her second one today, so maybe um, we will be in the land of the living again sometime soon. Um, I just want to, uh, I want to uh, um, say how pleased that I am that I get to uh, do this uh, a few times a year. You guys are, uh, you're, you're the Hall of Fame as far as uh, God's team is concerned, and, and I appreciate having the opportunity to minister. The, uh, as I was thinking about what I was going to do tonight, because uh, I, I do try to uh, do what God asked me to do in regard to any time that I speak, and, and my mind went to, and I, to the grieving that... Uh, that I am in the middle of uh, experience right now and maybe some of the grieving that you're uh, experiencing right now. And um, my grieving is because my best buddy at SAGU just resigned and unexpectedly and we're gonna lose him and he's, he's a great friend. So, so I'm grieving that, Bruce Rosedale. And uh, so I'm grieving that loss right now uh, a little bit. And I know for you, uh, some of you grieving the loss of Peter Pignon um, is, is tough. And uh, those are just uh, immediate situations that I'm aware of. I heard something about the Clark family uh, had a loss and, and there's, there's, there's grief involved there. Grief comes a lot of different ways. And I was um, getting ready to uh, speak to you tonight on, you know, what does the Bible say about grieving and how can we more effectively uh, do it in a positive fashion? Uh, and my mind went to, you know, Jesus as he uh, faced so many losses in his, his life. Um, but as I'm getting ready um, for that, I'm still not totally convinced that that's what I'm supposed to speak about. This morning, I was uh, doing my um, Bible reading, and uh, I'm using this year the uh, Chronological Bible, and I happen to be a bit ahead. Um, and I landed on um, three passages of Scripture this morning. And the three passages, one, uh, the first two, one from 2 Kings and one from uh, 2 Chronicles, uh, dealt with the dedication of the temple and, and um, Solomon's uh, time doing that and praising God for all that God had done for him in the process of, of um, uh, making that temple a reality. Uh, it took quite a while for it to be built. and and uh, and he was thanking God for that. But then they tuck in this Bible reading um, a psalm that we've read many, many times in our lives, but this morning it just kind of hit me in a, in a little bit different way. 
and the psalm is uh, Psalm 136. Okay, if you've got your Bibles, um, I'm, I'm going to read it to you. It's, it's 26 verses, um, but I would say it's really 13 verses, but we'll, we'll see what we're talking about. So if you've, if you've got your Bibles, um, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, they all basically are saying the same thing with just a little bit of difference. Verse 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who placed the earth on the water. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. You can say it with me. His faith. Amen. The sun to rule the day. His faith, love, faithful love endures forever. And the moon and star to rule the night. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who killed the firstborn of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He brought Israel out of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He brought Israel, I just said that, he acted on the strong hand and powerful arm. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. He led Israel safely through. His faithful love endures forever. But he hurled Pharaoh and his army into the sea. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who led his people through the wilderness. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who struck down mighty kings. His faithful love endures forever. He killed powerful kings. Sheho, king of the Amorites. And God, king of Bashan. God gave the land of these kings as an inheritance. A special possession to his servant Israel. He remembered our utter weakness. He saved us from our enemies. He gives food to every living thing. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Do you think? The writer of this uh, psalm had a point to be made. <laughs> this refrain uh, rivals any modern day chorus that we sing in church where we just repeat the same words over and over again. <laughs> because the writer of the psalm, many people believe, could have been Solomon. Uh, the theme of this is that God should be praised for his works of creation and providence, for his deliverance and his care for his people, and judgments on their enemies, and the goodness to all. See, the writer is, is saying that we need to be thankful for the great creator God, but also for the provider God, also for the protector God, and also for the God of every day of our lives, because his faithful love endures forever. A couple, two or three times ago when I was here, I tried just something a little bit different and uh, it worked out kind of well. I thought I'd just ask you to ask any kind of questions that you'd have that I could respond to. But I'm going to do 
something different than that, but something different than just speaking to you. Okay, I, I can do that. I do it all day long. Um, people get bored. They look up my bio. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> so tonight, um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, one of the things that we have learned over the last decade or so is the importance and the value of narrative. Narrative is simply a story. Story. Um, I know with my students at Sagu, when I tell them stories, they remember better than if I just lecture facts, right? It's just life. We are a narrative kind of people. We like to hear each other's stories. So what I am going to uh, take a risk, and I told God, you know, you, this is all up to you if it works or not, and if it doesn't, uh, we go eat pizza. <laughs> But I'm going to invite you um, to come up to this microphone in a few minutes and tell your narrative where you were able and are today able to look back and say, with the psalmist, his faithful love endures forever. We don't hear each other's stories much. Sometimes we do testimonies like we tried to do this evening, but we just throw out a word or two about something good that happened. And that's all good, but um, we, we've got a half hour. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, um, and I'll give you an example of what I'm looking for, and, and uh, then uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to take turns to come up and fill up this uh, 30 minutes that we have, or 25 minutes, and to give God uh, a great deal of glory through our stories. I want to hear your stories. Um, the story I'm going to tell you was, um, I was a relatively young man at the time. I was young and now I'm old. There's a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff that goes with that. but. But I thought I had it all together. I really did. I was, I was pretty arrogant. Uh, some would say I haven't come too far from that, but, <laughs> but I, I, was, I was a pretty arrogant young man as far as uh, God was concerned because I had him all figured out. And um, I was living in California, pastoring a church, church teaching high school, and, and um, God instructed me to uh, moved my family from California to Missouri. And uh, I responded. I resigned the church. I resigned my teaching position. And my wife was, you know, she's very cooperative, very, she's not going to fight most of those kind of decisions. And uh, we moved to Missouri and I didn't bother to ask God about living conditions. I didn't ask him about anything, quite honestly, except for I was going to Missouri where he told me to go, right? So I thought I was doing good, and pretty much I had life together. And um, uh, my wife and I, mostly me, selected a house to rent. I remember we'd moved from California where rent's much, much, much higher than Missouri. But I bought a, I rented a house that I could afford in California, not realizing that I had just priced myself way out of the market for where I was and what I was had. And um, I remember three weeks after getting there, coming to the realization um, <clears throat> of what a stupid decision that I had made, especially since I couldn't find a job that didn't pay more than minimum wage. And my wife couldn't find a job at all. And I'll, I'll never forget standing in front of this beautiful picture window in our living room in this nice house that we had rented and screaming at God. None of you ever scream at God because you're holy and righteous and better than I am. Okay, but I was screaming at God, how could you do this to me? How could you let me down? 
How could you not protect me? How could you not guide me? How could you not? And basically being very accusatory towards the God of the universe because uh, of the failure on my part, but what I perceived as the failure on his part. And I remember as I was looking out that window, I saw this rabbit jumping by on the lawn. And God said this into my heart. He says, who takes care of that rabbit? And begrudgingly, I said, you do. And he said to me, and God doesn't talk to you this way, but he does to me. And he said, listen, stupid. <laughs> Which he had every right to do since I yelled at him. He said, listen, stupid, if I can take care of that rabbit, I can take care of you. And all of a sudden, the circumstances hadn't changed outwardly, but the peace of God came over me. And I was able to say, his faithful love endures forever. Now, the end of that story is in a couple of weeks, I got a good paying job. My wife got a good paying job. We still were overpaying for a house that we'd signed a lease on. We couldn't get out of that. And we could have used better wisdom. But even in the midst of that tough time, God proved faithful in my life. Now, I could tell you stories about my children and, my, and things and the rest of my life. But that's the one that I'm saying to you that his love endures forever. Who has a narrative? You want to be the first. And the reason I have you bring it up here, because we get this wonderful camera, and if, if you stay back there, it's going to be blank the rest of the night, and people are going to go, what's wrong with Peter? And I don't want, I don't want anybody to worry about Peter. So, That's the question on the RN. Are they asking that? OK, come on up. Tell me your name so I know your name. Okay. Um, my name is Chadrick Ledbetter. Uh, I'm a student at SAGU, a first semester student. Um, I'm from Houston. Um, I was at Moody Theological Seminary for about a semester until I accepted a job in, uh, in Richardson as a special education teacher. Um, do we just jump right into this? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me breathe. <laughs> Uh, just to share the story, when um, I'm from, like I said, I'm from south of Houston. I grew up in a trailer park uh, with my single mother. Uh, if it makes any difference, she's Hispanic. Regardless, she was single. Um, and when I was about 18, I was sitting in biology class, and um, and we were learning about genetics. And in this, you know, me and my brother. I'm six three. Obviously, you can see my features. I don't need to explain them. Uh, but my brother is about five, eight, and he has green eyes, and, um, and we act totally different. And so, um, again, we were learning about genetics in biology class, and, and I couldn't, I asked her, I was like, well, would, would your sibling, would your full-blooded sibling be, be, would he look so much different? And she was like, I, I mean, science says no. So I went home and I asked my mother, um, you know, I was just super, really curious. I went home and asked my mother who my real, I, I legitimately, um, she, she was sitting in the, or in the laundry room, and I said, Mama, who's my, is Bruce my real dad? And obviously you don't, you don't I'm just going to say these names as if you know them. Um, yeah. and, I said, and I said, uh, if, is Bruce my real dad? And she said, well, and she dropped the, the laundry, and she said, well, what if he isn't? And, um, and I was like, <laughs> Okay, um, well, um, so we, it's about 10 steps back to my room, and uh, you know, as soon as she, we're walking, and she's in front of me, and as soon as she enters the room, um, she just breaks down. She just breaks down in tears, and um, she's crying profusely, and, and it, you know, obviously seeing your mother cry or someone cry, it really doesn't have to be your mother, but it'll, it'll make you emotional. And so I started crying, and then she told me that Bruce, who I believe was my real father for 18 years, um, who was a white man, I'm a Hispanic, um, who was a white man, uh, wasn't my real father. Um, so she had kept that from me for 18 years. I, I then in turn called my brother who had said he had already known um, since I was little. Um, 
I got on the phone with his wife, uh, of his, his new wife, who said she had known as soon as they got together. Um, I called my cousins, who eventually would turn into my uncles and aunts because they were his real brothers and sisters. Um, my biological father's brothers and sisters. Um, so in turn, I know we have to keep this short. There's a lot more uh, details in there, um, but I hated my mother. I legitimately hated my mother. Um, for obvious reasons, I was only 18 years old. I, I, I didn't have any emotional, um, anything, uh, anything educationally emotional to go back on, to fall back on like I do now. I, went, I eventually went to, to the Air Force um, and got out early, but, um, and then went to college and, and studied uh, human development and family studies. But I hated my mother for, the, for about two or three, two or three years. Um, and I even stopped believing in God. Um, I professed it and I proclaimed it and I told anyone who did believe in God that they're, they're, they're silly um, and, and uglier words than that. Um, so my only point is, is that I've forgiven my mother now, um, and it, but it's a practice, it's a daily practice. And, and what, what, really, what really drives me every day um, to forgive her um, is what if God held you to those same standards? Um, what if God treated you the way that you treat your mother? Um, what if God, and this is in an everyday instance, so whenever we say, whenever I read this, and it was my first time reading this, uh, His Faithful Love Endures Forever, um, I thank God for the people that are not in my life. I thank God for the people that are in my life. Um, I thank God for the patience and the kindness, because in Corinthians it does say love is patience and kindness. And they use that, or love is patient and kind. Um, I take it a step further by saying love is patience and kindness, um, and the writer, for whatever reason, theologians and, and Bible scholars would love to tell you that every single word in there is perfected. It, there's no filler words and things like that. Um, but they use the word patience first. Um, patience is long suffering um, and kindness. And, and I love, I'm a definition guy, so I don't have my phone with me, but I'd love to go through those definitions. And, and sometimes we hear patience is long suffering, um, which means you suffer for a long time. Um, it's the reason why you require patience. And so my mother being who she is, um, it just, in, when, when I hated her, that was just double hate from the weight of, of keeping that secret from me, from the weight of not allowing other people to tell me. And I was a, um, for lack of a better word, I was a, a poop head. I mean, I talk much, much crap to everybody. I was a basketball player and, and I just grew up in a, in a black community where, you know, we just jaw on the court. You know, and that's just the way it goes in football as well. And so I say that to say that you could have at any point, because everyone around me knew this, this, this story um, and about how my family wasn't actually my family and how I could be so silly and dumb and believe that my olive skin and that I'm a, a half white guy and half Mexican guy. But it turns out that my biological father is actually Mexican and Hispanic. So um, my world flipped upside down. Um, but that gives me no reason to hate because that means the devil won. Um, there is no hate in, or I, I take that back. There is, uh, there is hate in God and he, there's certain, he hates things that you should hate, uh, like a lying tongue and things like that. So um, I just want to give thanks to God in front of all of you um, and, and just let you know that God loves, does endure forever. Um, but again, if, if there was anything that I can impart, and I know that y'all, everyone has much wisdom for me, but every day... Um, it's difficult. I want anyone to know that it's difficult to talk to my mom and, and know that, um, and even my Bruce, who is my adopted dad, because uh, David is my biological father, um, but it's hard to talk to anyone and let them know, like, how could they have done that? Um, how could they have been so selfish? But again, even when I ask those questions, that's almost a condemnation to them. Um, it's ugly. It's ugly for me to say those things and think those things, regardless of what anyone says, because I truly believe that what, what if God said those same things about you? Um, and I'm speaking about myself, about every, the sins that I commit every day and knowing that I commit them um, and the things that I do every day. What if God treated me the same way? Um, so God lo God's love does endure forever. And, and if there was a challenge, and there's not, but I'm just saying if there is one, uh, and there's forgiveness in your heart, um, just know that there are people too. My mother's a person. Um, she has a heart, she has flesh, um, and it's not to say that she's not perfect, but um, I must forgive her. It, it's, a, it's a must for me, it's a must for her. It's a win for God, um, and it's a win for all of us um, in the church. So, um, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
quick story. About seven, eight, seven, eight years ago, I, I was going over to fix someone's computer at a house doing God's work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very small Hispanic family. And they had a coat rack across the doorway, you know, where they hung their clothes from. And as I walked through the door, I came up to it and I hit it at the top of my head. And I uh, didn't realize what happened at that moment, but it didn't knock me out or anything. But it got worse and worse and worse until the point where I was having panic attacks all the time. And I had to, you know, go to the doctor and you know, go to the chiropractor four or five times, six times a month. And uh, it got really bad. So I, I was on this medication that I, I could take it once every three hours. And I would just wait for those three hours at the end so I could take it again. And wait another three hours, take it again. And it was just really a horrible time in my life. I, mean, I don't know. You know why it happened, that doesn't matter, but bottom line is there was one night and, and I uh, was really having the panic attack so bad, I thought for sure I was going to have to go sec check myself into the hospital because it was just getting worse and worse and worse and the medication wasn't working and I was just saying, okay, I'm going to get in the car right now, I'm going to go to the psych ward, they're going to do something for me because it's just completely uncontrollable. But before I did, I called up this pastor who I He's a French-speaking pastor that he and I studied a lot together in French, and it was a really cool guy, very powerful guy. And I said, Pastor Zili, can you pray for me? And so he did, and instantly when he prayed, that panic just left like that, you know. And then it just I made it through the night, and I never had to go to the psych ward, and I got through all those all those years. There was quite a few years I had to go through this, but. That was just a crucial night that it was just getting so bad. And to see God just step in just because a man prayed, had the anointing, and God came and answered his prayer so that I could make it through the night. And that's just his love endures forever. If it's a race, you'll win. Uh, so I just wanted to share um, so I have a catalog of things uh, not just a few things but mm -hmm. just some highlights so in 2004 I lost my first son and um, it's odd how you learn from things like that that no matter what God weaves goodness through even the most uh, painful things and in that situation so that situation was used for good because it really started to break me down to the bare parts. And um, what I mean by that is I got pretty, pretty full of myself um, and, you know, had some sense of importance in the world, I guess. And um, that really made me question everything. Um, and so since I'm a slow learner, in, in 2014, I actually uh, got very sick to where I could hardly remember even my name. Um, and nine months of a lot of work um, changed me. And what my things like my cognitive ability and my, um, you know, certain amount of natural intelligence and photographic memory and all that sort of thing, well, those are history. Um, I can't even hardly remember Bible verses anymore because I there's a part of my mind that doesn't work the same. However, that's a good thing actually, because I'm not as full of myself anymore, right? And so I'm, I'm just really grateful that um, God loves me enough. You know, I could go on a long time, and just the, my whole testimony from the moment I was born. Um, but through that whole story, God loves me enough, A, to discipline me, B, to love me through things and help me to see the good in things so that in turn I can actually have compassion on other people and not be so full of myself. So I'm actually very grateful for that. I just jumped up so that nobody else was going to. So if someone else wants to, they can come. Um, as we were talking about how his, his everlasting love endures forever, his faithful love endures forever, it made me think about, you know, we don't always know when we look at a person what their past is, and, and we always assume that, that, you know, that finished product we see now is what's always been. And um, as we were talking about this, I was recalling back in my life, back about my junior high years, I started going through a real crisis of depression. You could call me clinically depressed. 
And um, I remember one time watching television with my sister, and I think it was Laverne and Shirley, and they were acting silly on the show, and I remember saying, I wish people really could be that happy, and she went, they can be. And so, and just this, this terrible depression, there were was, was some family issues, my dad being an alcoholic and things like that, a lot, of, a lot of spiritual depression also in the family and things because of all that stuff. And um, so fast forward a bit, I'm going to college, uh, I'm going to UTA, majoring in nursing, a major that I hated, but I was doing it because it was what was expected of me. I was extremely miserable. I was in a long, dark tunnel that I had been in for years and I could see no end. And I had come home to visit and it was time to get back in the car Sunday afternoon and to go back to school. And I was already, I had already decided what bridge I was going to drive off of because I was sick of it and I couldn't figure a way out of this tunnel. I couldn't figure a way of how to tell my parents I didn't want to do this anymore. And my very responsible, now husband, at the time was just my friend slash sometimes date partner. Um, he, boyfriend. boyfriend, okay, boyfriend, <laughs> friend slash boyfriend. Uh, I was getting ready to go, and he called me, and he said, we had a special speaker that night, musician, and he said, why don't you come to church? And I said, I've got to go back to school. He said, I'll just skip school on Monday. Okay, now he's a professor. I'll just skip school on Monday. And at that time, <laughs> he still remember. At that time, it sounded really good. And so I said, okay, I went to church that night. And there was just a beautiful move of God that night. And um, I was freed from that depression in one service. And that depression has never come back, ever. Nothing to that degree. His faithful love endures forever. So just that freedom I walk in is just so glorious. So that's, that's my testimony. Sing my testimony. <laughs> I'd have to stand here all night to talk about God's goodness in my life. I grew up in church, and my parents were pastors probably three-fourths of my childhood. My mom taught at Sagu for years. I grew up seeing miracles. You know, we had the crusades and things like that. I saw people being healed. I saw people speaking in tongues. I saw people being set free, and I knew that, and I watched God move. But then my parents got, they, they got separated my freshman year of high school. And you know, teenagers are just rebellious anyways. So on top of I'm a teenager, I'm going to be a little bit rebellious. I also, I think I was, I mean, I just think I know I was acting out because I'm hurting. You know, my parents are fighting back and forth. I'm the only child, so I'm pulled in the middle of it. I mean, really, it's just an excuse. But I noticed that I had to go through that to be able to see the God that I know today. Um, long story short, I went all through my high school years. They, were, they got separated my freshman year. They got divorced right after my graduation, or in May, and I graduated in June. And um, my senior year, my entire senior year, I actually dated the guy that I'm married to now. We fought the whole time. We loved each other, but, you know, we were young and stupid and, you know, teenage boys are crazy. <laughs> Anyways, so we were fighting. We were irritable. My parents were going through this divorce. I'm getting all this in one ear and in the other ear about my parents. You know, just, you know how, I don't know if any of you have experienced divorced parents, but it's not easy on the child. And so right after I graduated from high school, it was actually three days after my 18th birthday, I woke up one morning. We had just moved into a new home, and my mom was house-sitting for a family friend. And I'm, you know, 18. I want to stay at my house by myself. We, we just moved, and I'm like, this is exciting. I want to just stay there by myself. Well, I woke up three days after my 18th birthday, and I couldn't hardly walk from countertop to countertop because I was so weak. You know, we've all been sick. You know, I just, I don't know, never had the flu, but thought maybe it was something like that. And it just kind of progressively got worse and worse. And then there's not a lot that I remember, but over about three days, I didn't eat. I couldn't hardly do anything but sleep. And finally, my mom said, we've got to take her to the hospital. They did a 5,000 pregnancy test. I don't know why. They just, whatever. And they sent me home and treated me for nausea. And um, after the next few days, um, I literally just wouldn't wake up. I would wake up for a few minutes at a time, and my mom's like, something's wrong. We've got to take her back. So they took me back, and the doctors did a CAT scan, and they said she's either got a brain tumor, what's called herpes encephalitis, which is from a mosquito, um, just like you would get you know, anything from a mosquito, mosquito bite. Um, what was the other one? Anyway, there were three different things. It was like a tumor. Um, oh, my goodness. I can't think. 
you'll see why in a minute. Anyways, there was three different things that they said, she's got to go to the Big Baylor in Dallas because something's really wrong. We can't treat her here. They rushed me to Dallas. The only things that I really remember is hearing somebody say if she wouldn't have gotten here last night, she would have never woken up the next morning. So here I am, 18, you know, raised in church, but not really living for the Lord. I mean, I'm dating a guy. We were living as a Christian couple shouldn't live before you get married. And I don't know that I didn't necessarily, I mean, I knew that there were things wrong with it, but you get lost and you don't realize you're lost for a little while, if that makes sense. Anyways, long story short, I was actually in this church. I'd been in this church for, I don't know, gosh, 12 to 15 years, something like that. And it was like the God that I had heard all of my life and that I knew who he was had to become personal to me, had to become real. I had to literally see and feel him move. I mean, it was one thing after another in the hospital. My jaw popped out of place, the medicine they were giving me for this infection. I actually ended up having what's called herpes encephalitis. They said that I got it from a mosquito bite and um, one in so many hundreds of thousands of cases survive. And here I am 21 years later, but it was, it's really hard to sum up because I spent about three or four weeks in the hospital. Um, from the minute I got sick, people at SAGU, people all over the world were praying for me. So even looking back now, you know, you know, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes you see people and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry you're not feeling good. I'll be praying for you this week. And then we go home and we forget. And we don't pray for that person. It's not that we have bad intentions. It's that we get wrapped up in our own lives and our own kids and our own families. And But the Lord reminds me from that, what if people prayed for you then? how you pray for people now. Now that's pretty convicting. <laughs> what, and so anyways, long story short, I just, I was sick for about, I don't know, gosh, six months in and out of the hospital. Um, every time I would get a little bit better, I would get worse and I would almost die again. And it was like, I have seen for 21 years since then, for so many different reasons, I have seen the enemy try to take me out. Even before that, I mean, I slipped my arm open when I was a little kid at five years old. I almost ran out in front of a dump, dump truck. I look back now and I see the enemy trying to take out this worshiper, that God's called me to be a worshiper, to proclaim his good news, his faithfulness that endures forever and ever. And I realized going through all of the trials, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I couldn't even tell you everything, even just this last year that I've experienced. Things that we've prayed for for 12 years that had to happen at a specific time in a specific way, along with other things that were so painful betrayals. I can't even begin to tell you everything, but we had to see every detail come together to recognize God's faithfulness. And through that experience, other people are encouraged. So I guess really all I'm trying to say is that it's not always easy and we're not always promised that tomorrow's going to come. Uh, you know, we've lost three loved ones in the last, I don't know, four months. And that's been challenging on my family, but I can tell you the joy that we have experienced in just singing and worshiping through the heartache has just, it's been incredible in my life. It's been transformational. So my story could go on and on and on forever. I'm telling you, we'd have to go to like lunch and dinner and a few breakfasts to talk about it. But just to be on death's door, to be standing here now, I see, you know, I still have some issues. I'm having to go see a neurologist and things like that. But to, I was actually, I should have said I was actually healed. I got I got sick, was sick for about a year. It took me a year to recover. I lost about 63 or 67 pounds in a month and a half, just not being able to eat. But then God healed me. I went to college, got married, had some kids, had no problems for 13 years. Then I quit my job because God said to get back into ministry. Bam, first seizure. Never had any seizures, never had any problems. I told my doctor after my illness, I'm not going to take seizure medicine because I know God healed me. And then spent 13 years healed. But then I get into ministry, and that's when Satan really started to work. And so here I am, and it's been, thin. it's been 11 years. I've been on and off seizure medicine because of insurance and this, that, and the other. I have seen how the enemy has strategically tried to, tried to take me out again and again and again and again. But I'm still standing, and I just, I think that through every trial, you know, God's just, he's developing this testimony while Satan's trying to invalidate everything God's done. So now let's go to brun uh, brunch and let, I can't talk. Breakfast and lunch, and we'll talk about the rest. <laughs> Do we have time for one more? We have one more coming up. Is she coming up or is she going out? <laughs> she doesn't want any. Okay. Okay. Come on down. Oh, you got a baby coming down. Okay. Yeah.
I've seen that mo a little story about <laughs> this little guy right here. Um, when <laughs> yeah, we were, she was about 30 weeks pregnant with him, and uh, we went for the root, one of the routine uh, sonograms, mm -hmm. and the lady doing the sonogram said that there might be something wrong with his heart, but they didn't know exactly. They didn't know if one of his something wasn't working the right. The what? The, I'm pretty sure it was the valve. Yeah, one of the valves or something wasn't working right. So they sent us to a high-risk doctor to uh, get it checked out. You know? Come to find out, they did a, a more enhanced or whatever sonogram and found out he has a cardiovascular ring above his heart. It's where the artery goes. Instead of going well, around the esophagus, his go, well, his, it, it normally goes up and then loops around. Whatever, his goes down and loops around his esophagus and his trachea. And we only had just a few weeks. We had to make a decision on whether to have it at the regular hospital we, more, we would have had him at or go. They really wanted us to go to uh, UT Southwestern in Dallas because uh, they had a higher level NICU and they would be able to have everybody there when he was born. <coughs> and uh, well, they said that um, since we were not in Medical City that they would have to care fly him there. Yeah, they had to care fly him. To, uh, and then they weren't Dallas. sure if he was going to be breathing either. So, so uh, but let's just, let's backtrack a little bit about when you went to your sister's house, mm -hmm. and she's not exactly. I don't know if she believes in God or not. She doesn't believe in God. She she uh, I don't know. She believes in like. Lord told me to go pray for her, and so I was about 30 weeks pregnant when I went in to pray for her, but when I was praying for her, I got really dizzy, and I said, maybe we should go get some lunch, so I went in and let her go eat something, <clears throat> and so um, the next day I had an appointment, and that's when they started giving me, like, really bad results, but ever ever since, like, after 30 weeks, every time we would go to the doctor, it would be some, some negative, something negative, every time, from gestational diabetes, I constantly kept having strep. Um, he started um, giving fluid on the outside of his yeah, lung. Yeah. I mean, just something negative every time. And I was just constantly just praying, praying. And I mean, prayer got me through it because if not, I probably wouldn't be sleeping at night. But it got me through it. But, um, you know. Um, but when he was born, yeah. first thing I asked, is he breathing on his own? They said yes. So they, he, they, they cleaned him up. She got to hold him for about five minutes, mm -hmm. and then they rushed him, and I went with him back to the NICU. Uh, to the NICU. Mm -hmm. They drained the fluid off. They were going to test it for cancer. They, and te all they sorts wanted to test things. it for three days of course, to make sure yeah. what nothing, caused it. It came back, and nothing was They me. never figured out what happened, what, what caused it, and it never came back. <laughs> so. And they said everything's good as long as he's breathing, he's eating. They don't have to do any major surgery on him. But um, that was really like a tough and trial for us, you know. Trust me, it's love. He goes forever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Amen. Amen. This is exciting. Let's all stand. I'm going to end it different too, okay? There's a prayer that says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Let's let that be our blessing for tonight. Thank you all for being here.